receiving uh, people coming in. Hi, everybody, as you join, um, we're just going to give a few minutes for, uh, for people to join in. And uh, feel free to tell us where you're from. Love to you know, hear where people are, are joining us from. You can do so in the chat. Uh, I'm based in Arlington, just outside Arlington, Virginia, just outside of DC. Um, Katie, I think you're in the Bay Area, is that right? And Jacita, you're in LA, and Suki, I think you're in uh, the Boston area, right? I'm in the Boulder, Colorado area, actually. Oh, moved, okay. Moved about a year ago. Oh, terrific. A, a COVID move. A COVID move. Yeah. So we have uh, people so far, we have uh, France, Mexico City, Russia. Let's see. Vilnius, Lithuania, New York City, Costa Rica, Portland, Oregon, Ireland, Lisbon. I love seeing where everyone's coming from. Ecuador, Indonesia, Norway. Oh my God, it's going faster than I can read it. Colombia, uh, other places in Mexico, Lebanon, Argentina. Ecuador, did I already say that one? Uh, New Delhi, Brazil, Vancouver, Trinidad and Tobago, Panama, Brussels, Berkeley, Oxford. Love this. Italy, okay, from everywhere. All right, Somalia, Buenos Aires, Michigan, Switzerland, Bahrain, India. So as people join, feel free to tell us where you're calling in from, or joining us from, calling in, what is this, 1985, where you're joining from. And uh, we'll just give people a couple minutes here. Um, we had a record number of, of registrants. So I just wanna give people a little bit of time to, to join in here. Um, I know, given we have people from all over the world, it's morning, afternoon, evening, it's everything. So it's great. What was the uh, final count on registrants? We had over, uh, last I looked, it was 1,014. So, Cambridge, I lived in Cambridge for a year, Cambridge, Mass, Pakistan, another one in Colorado, Madison, Wisconsin, Egypt, DC, hey, just down the street, Abu Dhabi. Okay. I'm not going to read them all, but it's great seeing them all here. I love it. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, we'll give another 15 or 30 seconds here and then we'll go ahead and get going. All right, someone here, hey, my hometown, or not hometown, but current town. Or in DC, Guam. All right, terrific. Well, thank you. Thanks for everybody uh, joining us today. I'm super excited. Um, let me get my, um, spiel here and we'll get rolling. So first, um, welcome to the fifth of our six science editing webinars from the Knight Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT. Today's topic is using social media to source and spread uh, science journalism. My name is Joshua Hatch and I'm your host today. I'm a former Knight Science Journalism Fellow and the editor of the KSJ Science Editing Handbook, uh, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. This is the penultimate webinar for 2021, and I'm really excited to get it started. Uh, before I do, though, I'll just say that if you missed our first four, uh, you can rewatch recordings of them at ksjhandbook.org. And actually, let me uh, put that on the screen here. Give me one second. Got to find the right uh, window to share. Um, OK. Um, so you can go to that site to watch uh, the first four. We have recordings of them posted there. And you can also go there to read the handbook. Uh, just look for the menu that says webinars. Um, you can see them all. And you can also sign up for our final webinar in this series, which is going to feature Ed Young, Emily Anthes, and Apurva Mandavili. That webinar will be September 23rd. All of these webinars are an extension of our recently published online science editing handbook, which you can also find at ksjhandbook.org. Org. And I encourage you to visit, uh, read the handbook online. You can download it as a PDF. 
And I'm also excited to say that we'll soon have a Spanish translation available on the site. Look for that in the next week or two. The uh, handbook has 10 chapters. It covers uh, a whole variety of topics, including today's. Okay, dog. Um, both, the handbook, both the handbook and this webinar series are made possible and made free to you thanks to the uh, support of the Cavley Foundation um, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Department of Science Education. And they're an outgrowth of a several years long set of Cavley supported in-person science editing workshops. So we're really pleased to be bringing this to a much bigger audience online. And I wanna give a huge thank you to Cavley and HHMI. Also, thank you to everyone at the KSJ Fellowship uh, at MIT, which is hosting these webinars, and to SciComm X, which is uh, uh, working to produce them. So today's webinar is going to run about 90 minutes. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna introduce our three terrific panelists, each of whom will talk for about 15 minutes, and then we'll move swiftly into a Q&A session uh, with as many people joining us today as possible uh, that we have. Uh, I, look for a lot of questions and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, if you're participating on Zoom, you can use the QA button to send in questions, which I'll be monitoring and we'll post to the panelists. We'll also be recording the session and posting, our, posting it on our website, along with copies of today's presentations. If you want to uh, live tweet the webinar, you can do so um, and just tag us on Twitter with the hashtag KSJ Science Editing. Feel free to let others know they can also follow along um, at the uh, link on the screen. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the site sometime soon. For those on Zoom, if you attend at least an hour, you'll receive a certificate of attendance. We'll also send around a survey after the webinar is complete. These surveys are really important and pretty brief. So we'd appreciate you taking the time to complete it and let us know what you think. Okay. So now it's time to introduce today's uh, panelists. I'm sorry, here's some additional notes being recorded and so on. Um, so today's panelists. First up, we have Katie Fleeman. Katie is the Audience Outreach and Strategy Manager for Knowable Magazine, a nonprofit publication covering science and research for a broad audience. She previously worked at the digital media startup Attention and the op uh, open access publisher PLOS. She is currently based in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, north of the Facebook campus and south of Twitter HQ. Uh, last year, Katie contributed to the chapter on social media for the handbook, uh, and her very first social media account was a MySpace profile. Uh, you can currently find her at Fleemanator on Twitter, and Katie is going to provide a brief overview of some current best practices with social media. Jacida Giles is an artist and creative storyteller working in the social media, excuse me, working as social media editor for Kaiser Health News, where she manages the newsroom and social media channels and co-produces Kaiser's video mini series, Behind the Byline. Her own bylines can be found in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, USA Today, NPR, The Daily Beast, and more. <clears throat> and before uh, Kaiser, as the social media and communication specialist for the American Society of Microbiology, she started the society's annual agar art contest where microbiologists drew agar art, excuse me, where they drew on petri dishes with bacteria to create uh, artwork. The international contest has been featured in the Huffington Post, Discover Magazine, and USA Today. She also wrote about using social media for science communication in ASM's Cultures Magazine. She has a bachelor's in communications from Boston College and received her social media management certification at Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies. She is CG on social on Twitter and today she's going to talk about using social for reporting and source discovery. And then anchoring our webinar relay team is Suki Bennett, di senior digital, uh, excuse me, senior digital editor at Nova, where she manages its social strategy and writes weekly newsletters, reports, and edits science news articles, and collaborates on its YouTube series, Parentologic, and podcast Nova Now. She earned a master's in science communication from UC Santa Cruz and a bachelor's in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Colorado, excuse me, Colorado Boulder. A former New England aquarium educator, she has an endless passion for animals, conservation, and the outdoors, and thinks astronomy is pretty cool too. She's Suki underscore B on Twitter, and she has some specific tips on social headlines, videos, and much more. So again, please make ample use of the chat and QA features, and we'll make sure to get to as many questions as we can. So let me stop sharing 
And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Katie. Katie, take it away. All right. Give me one second just to start up this slideshow and make sure my screen sharing is working properly. And is everyone seeing that? Good? Yep, good. Look good. All right, great. So thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I am so honored and humbled by all of the interest there is in this topic. I am going to be starting us off with the social media 101 session, um, basically trying to cover some of the foundations of what social media is, what you should be thinking about going into your social media strategy, and a very, very quick overview of um, some of the major platforms. Um, I will note that um, almost every single one of these, um, pardon me on that, almost every single one of the slides that I'm going to be going through today could probably be a webinar of its own. Um, apologies, there was supposed to be an actual agenda on this slide. Um, this is a little PowerPoint snafu that will be there when this comes out. Um, so every single slide in here could probably be a webinar all of its own. So I'm really trying to focus more on breadth rather than depth. If there's anything in particular um, you would like us to talk about more, please put that in the Q&A box. And also, as Josh mentioned, um, Suki and Chisita will also both be going into more depth of specific topics in their own presentations. So the first thing that I would like to talk about are a few things to think about before you even start going on to social media. Uh, the first thing you should consider are what are your goals? Social media is pretty infinite. There are lots of platforms, different products on every single platform, and you really want to think about what you're trying to get out of it before you even start. That way you're not completely inundated with all of the different options. Um, some common ones you might be thinking about are wanting to bring readers back to your site. Are you trying to foster trust or relationships in your community? Are you looking for stories? Or are you really just trying to get information out there? Um, thinking about um, your goals up at the top and at the beginning will help you when you're trying to make your decisions um, about what you want to do and perhaps even more crucially what you don't want to do. Uh, the second thing I do want to emphasize at the beginning is that you should be thinking about social media as part of a broader audience strategy. Uh, this graph that I pulled was from Parsley, um, which is a web analytics tool, and I got it over the weekend, um, showing where different, if you're really thinking about trying to get traffic to your website, social media is going to be a good chunk of it, but it's not going to be the end of it. And you are probably going to be thinking more broadly about other channels or other tools that you're using to reach and engage your audience. If that's newsletters, if that is search, if you're partnering with aggregators, um, if you're really thinking about engagement, that might be polls or surveys, a comment section. Maybe you're trying to think about having an impact on policy. Um, there are a lot of other avenues you should be thinking about when you're thinking about audience more broadly. Um, and Katie, I wouldn't, yeah. I apologize for interrupting. I think you're, you might want to try to be sharing the screen. It's um, showing in a vertical fashion. Oh, okay. So you might just want to give it a quick, sorry about that. No worries. I have... If, let me try that one more time. Policy from current slide. Let's we'll give it one second here so we make sure people are able to read it okay. What we're going to always... do. Go ahead, Katie. Oh, yes. What we are going to do is turn off my vertical screen. <laughs> that will probably help. while you're doing that, I see we have lots more people joining us or a couple of, of sort of just administrative questions. Um, somebody asked about certificates of attendance that will come out a couple of days after the, um, the webinar completes. Um, so you'll receive those um, a couple of days after. And uh, somebody also asked about the, the workshop uh, webinar. This is the fifth in a six part series. Each of the webinars is on a different topic. So, um, that's what you can expect there. Okay, great, Katie looks great. Sorry to have interrupted you and I'll just hand it back to you. 
Well, is the um, slide, is the little Zoom box showing up on the top or is that just for me? I think that's just for you, you look great. Okay, cool. Sorry about that, everyone. Where was I? I'm just gonna start from the top again with this one slide. Um, basically think about audience as part, um, think about social media as part of a broader audience strategy. You're probably thinking about other things. Um, and I would refer you to um, the chapter that I wrote for the Night Science Handbook. If you wanna learn more, um, I talked to a lot of people who are doing some other things um, that I mentioned on this slide. Uh, and the third thing I do want to emphasize before we even think about um, what you're doing yourself on social media is also thinking about how you're packaging your stories. Um, and when I say packaging, I mean thinking about your headline and the preview image that's coming up with your story. Um, for a lot of you, a lot of your quote unquote social traffic is probably not even going to be coming from your own social media sites. Um, for Knowable, I can say that about 65% of our Twitter traffic and 75% of our Facebook traffic is actually coming from other people sharing our stories. So either, you know, people sharing stories because they want their friends to see it, um, if another publication wants to put it on their platform, if a nonprofit group, an advocacy group, a page, it's coming from other people. Um, so if you're trying to think about the most minimum um, you could almost say like marketing currency that you have for your article, it is going to be that headline and your image. Those are going to be hard coded into your website. So they'll follow your story around all of the different social platforms. Um, and depending on, that's why I've got a picture of the little, um, the code down there at the bottom. That's what it looks like if you put this article into like a debugging tool to show you what the code looks like. Um, if depending on your uh, your content management system, you might even have the ability to customize a different headline to show up for social. Um, that might be different than what shows up on your site. And I also pulled this specific example from the New Yorker um, because I believe that this one actually even had a different headline when it was in print versus when it was on digital. Um, so that kind of shows how they were thinking a little bit about how they were going to package their story in order for it to go on social or on the website as opposed to showing up in print. Cool. Now, a couple of key concepts that are going to be pretty, um, that are going to be applying to a lot of different platforms. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind, social media is a social space. Um, you're they're not people are not necessarily always coming to social media just to get their news. Um, some people might be disciplined and that's what they're doing, but a lot of people are going on to Facebook or Twitter or whatever to catch up with their friends, creep on their family, um, get some gossip from people that they don't they haven't seen in a long time, follow influencers, if you want to say, follow, you know, fan groups they might be a part of. There really is going to be a huge mishmash of people and different types of content that is showing up in this space. So you do have to think, one, that you want to be respectful of the fact that you are coming into someone's social space, and two, also that you are competing with um, these other types of content in this space. You are trying to compel someone that they really do want to read your article about mitochondria instead of scrolling past to look at a picture of their friend's cat. Uh, you might not win against the cat, but <laughs> you can always try. Um, the second thing I want to point out, um, social media as an extension of that there might be a quote unquote brand voice and that might be your publication um it might be if you have like a very proper reporter profile something that's more like an actual brand um versus personal use which might just be i'm going in because i want to scroll through and i'm not thinking professionally right now and social media does have that sort of overlap space where you could have something that was a personal use kind of profile and it's become more of a professional use. And I think it just is important to be mindful about which one you're using and how you're using it. Um, for example, um, you know, you might want to say that like Instagram is going to be private for me, but then Twitter is going to be my public profile. Um, another thing that I think about when I think about the brand voice versus personal use is that if I am posting things for knowable, um, I'm kind of speaking from the point of, you know, the publication. Um, even if the publication does have a bit of a voice, it still is a bit of a, you know, a brand. Whereas if you're an individual person, you can actually put a little bit more of an 
individual touch if you're sharing your story. So for example, if you are, if you had just gotten a story published, you can post something about, oh, it was so much fun reporting on this. I really loved being able to go visit here, like something that's a little bit more personal and shows more of you. Whereas if I went in as knowable and said, oh, I had so much fun, you know, reporting this, that that would just not be very true because I am not the one actually reporting it. Um, and the third thing I do want to mention is um, the algorithms. So for better or for worse, a lot, most of the social platforms um, rank their content based on some algorithmic formula. There's a bunch of different ranking um, factors that will go into what content gets surfaced. As there is some hints as to what those algorithms are looking for. Um, Facebook or the other platforms might give you hints about what they say they are valuing. Um, you could arguably say that what they say is not always true. Um, and there are a lot of marketing blogs, tech reporters who are keeping an eye on that. And you can see what is actually surfacing as well. And then I also would really, really encourage you, um, please look at your own analytics to see what's doing well for you, because what might be doing well based on what everyone says the algorithm wants might not actually be what your audience of your own um, pages wants. Uh, three other commonalities I want to go through. One is mobile. Um, most social media use is going to be happening on a cell phone. Where is that important? One, you have to think it's going to be small. Um, it's easy when you're working on a story to be looking on your desktop and you see it very big and you think that's how people are experiencing it. But really remember, people are experiencing something on a very small screen. Um, mobile is also important to keep in mind because people are probably on the go while they are accessing your stories. They might be in line at the grocery store, they're sitting on the train going to work, um, depending on pre-pandemic time. Um, they might just be scrolling on their couch. Um, it might not necessarily be a dedicated time um, where they are sitting there and like opening up a news newspaper. Um, it is they are on the go. Um, the next concept, hashtags, I think most people are probably familiar with this. Um, a hashtag is a way of um, uh, putting together like a keyword for certain content. Um, it is maybe a phrase that goes along with a live event. Um, it's a really good way of helping make your content more discoverable. Um, for example, if you are covering a conference and there's a conference hashtag, if you are covering a live news event and there's a live news hashtag, um, that will help other users who might be following that particular hashtag find your work. I do want to note that hashtags are more important for some platforms than others. Um, they originated on Twitter, but I would argue that they might be even more important for Instagram now. Um, so just be mindful that you can't just add one hashtag and that's going to completely change the reach of your post. Um, they'll be helpful, but they're not necessarily a magic bullet. Um, I also want to do one quick PSA here. Um, if you're doing hashtags with multiple words, like hashtag public health, um, one recommendation I've seen is that you capitalize the individual words in the hashtag. So public health, capital P, capital H, um, because that does help um, audiences who use screen readers um, with being able to actually read out the hashtag. Um, and the final thing I wanted to mention were mentions or tags. Um, that's a little at symbol. There are a couple different ways that you can tag other users in a post. Um, a mention might be if you are, you know, you actually tag their name or their handle within the body of a post. And then a tag is more like if there's a photo and you tag them in the photo. Those are both helpful ways for notifying someone um, that they are in, you know, being mentioned in your post. If you're interviewing a scientist and they're very active on social media, um, you might want to consider tagging them on Twitter. Um, also, please be respectful with them if you are interviewing someone and you say they have a private Facebook page. Um, don't tag their private Facebook page if it's not public um, because you do want to respect their boundaries in that way. All right, so now I am going to go through a very quick survey of the major platforms. Um, please keep in mind that what I am going to be saying are rough guidelines, not gospel. Um, I really am just scratching the surface. Um, 
And also, I love this meme. I think that it encapsulates sort of the personality of a lot of these platforms better than um, anything else. So if you're familiar with The Breakfast Club, um, I hope this helps. <laughs> One very quick caveat I do want to give off the bat. Um, there are a lot of differences in how people use social media based on where they are in the world or if they're part of a specific um, community. Um, one example, I was trying to go through and pull some quick demographic information, but when you even try to pull demographic information, it gets a little tricky. Um, this is from a Hootsuite report um, that I believe was published earlier this year. The link's in there and you'll get that when the slides go out. Um, and you'll see that if you look at the gender breakdown for Facebook in the United States, it's more predominantly female. And then when you go and look worldwide, it's more predominantly dominantly male. Um, so this is all just to say, please um, take the time to research a little bit more about what um, usage patterns are like in your particular region or community, because it might be different than what I go through right now. This is meant to just be basic guidelines. Um, and the link is there. That report has, it's like 300 pages just for worldwide. And then there's a different report for almost every country. So I would recommend um, going through that. All right, platform number one, Facebook. This is the big one. Facebook has more monthly users than the population of China and Indian combi in India combined. Um, if you look across their user base, um, they have the broadest audience. And by that, I mean the broadest in terms of age, in terms of education, um, in terms of urban, suburban, rural divide. Um, there are, I'm not going to say that it's a perfect representation of the population because there are still patterns within that. But if you're looking for a broad audience, it's going to be on Facebook. Um, I want to especially point out that if you're thinking about an older audience, um, a lot of social media platforms tend to skew younger 20s or um, teens, 20s, 30s. But if you're looking older than that, 55 and up, um, silent generation, the one they're most likely going to be on is Facebook. Also, I'd like to point out Facebook only has two O's in it. And I got so excited while I was putting this together, I apparently put in an extra O. Um, a few key products to know about. Um, Facebook pages, most of you are probably familiar with the Facebook page. Your publication probably has one and is posting your content um, on a Facebook page. So that will be the official branded one. It's got your icon. Um, you're probably mostly sharing links. Um, images and um, videos also do very well on Facebook. Arguably, it is because Facebook wants to keep people on their platform, and those are the kinds of content that keep people on their platform versus going out to another website. Um, so I would recommend that if you are thinking about putting things on Facebook, you are trying to keep images or videos, which are um, a little bit higher touch, but keeping those in the mix. Um, but it is still good to be putting your articles on there as well. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up are Facebook groups. So a few years ago, um, Facebook had announced they were shifting their algorithm and groups became more of a dominant uh, way of interacting on the platform. So a group would be if you've got an affinity group, like I am part of an IKEA greenhouse um, Facebook group, which are all people, are, you know, all over the place who really like to um, try to turn IKEA cabinets into greenhouses. Um, and those are pieces of content, um, like that is a really interesting way of interacting with people. Um, Facebook groups are a much higher, um, more resource intensive way of using Facebook. Um, it takes a lot more moderation. It takes a lot more admin oversight in order to make sure that your page is lively and engaged and civil. Um, so if you are thinking about launching one, I do suggest being very um, thoughtful about it. Like for Knowable at this point, I just don't think that it's worth it for us um, to put in the amount of energy that it would take to create a really engaged group. Another option is that you can try to find groups that are in an area that you're covering and seeing if they would allow you to be part of that group, either posting your content or talking to members. Um, you can try to message the admins and see if they'd be willing to allow you into their space. 
Um, and oh, I will notice um, I have on each one of these a quick little table of some of the like top things to know. Um, one specific one um, to point out, I did pull in the lifespan of a post. Um, this is based on what I've seen um, and kind of the general rule of thumb um, that you get in the marketing world, but they are still guidelines. Um, your post might last longer, it might die faster. Um, and I will be honest, if something is really poorly put together or if there's like a very egregious mistake, um, it is possible that something can live a lot longer uh, than that um, because it could live on in the form of screenshots and people reminding you about it. Um, so that is just the, my caveat about that lifespan of a post note. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is Twitter. Um, it is short, it is quick, it is newsy. There are a lot of power uh, power users who are info junkies. Um, they are very, it's a very newsy space. Um, most of you probably know a tweet, 280 characters. Want to point out if you're sharing a link that does take some of the characters off of your tweet. Um, one thing when I'm getting tweets from our writers um, that for knowable that I notice the most is that they'll do the full 280 characters and then I have to chop off a bunch of them so I can fit a link in there. Um, a couple of other ways that you can use Twitter, you can thread different tweets together. If you wanna put together a more compelling story, you can quote retweet. That means sharing someone else's tweet and putting some commentary on it. And um, if you really are interested in using Twitter more, I'd really recommend looking into TweetDeck, which is Twitter's product. It gives you a much more, um, you're able to set up different lists. It's a little overwhelming um, if you, if you um, aren't used to using Twitter, but it's a really good way if you know I wanna follow a specific, you know, a specific hashtag, a specific keyword. If I really am like, I just wanna only follow um, you know, I want a whole column that's just, you know, publications I want to pitch to, um, that would be a recommendation is looking into TweetDeck. Instagram. Instagram is owned by Facebook. It is primarily a visual platform. Um, their demographic tends to run younger, millennial, Gen Z. They're historically known, um, historically, but they're historically known for more aspirational or beautiful imagery, you know, thinking vacation photos, things like that. Um, but there is still other room for just beautiful artwork. If you have wonderful artwork to go with your stories. Another recent trend I put here is these quote unquote slideshows. Um, those are a format that are all text and it's using a couple of different, like almost like putting a little slideshow up on Instagram to talk, to tell a story or to give information. Um, other pieces that they have, um, stories. So a story is a piece of ephemeral content. It was completely, it was copied from Snapchat. Uh, they only last about 24 hours and that can be video, it can be text, it can be sharing a post. Um, a lot of engagement on Instagram is actually happening through those stories. Um, videos or reels. Um, Instagram is really pushing reels right now, which is a short form of video, um, probably because they're trying to um, snag users away from TikTok. Um, but that is a piece of content they're really pushing right now are these short like 30 second videos. Um, and hashtags are really important on Instagram. Um, so really be mindful of trying to research what hashtags people might be using in the topic that you're posting about. Um, one tip is to maybe come up with a list of 50 or 60, um, which sounds like a lot, but you wanna have a big list of maybe these are all like hashtag science, hashtag science is cool, hashtag nature photography. And then that way, when you're posting, you've got a big stable that you can go back to and pick maybe what are the most 10 or 12 that are the most relevant to your post. Reddit, Reddit is quote unquote, the front page of the internet. Um, their demographic is largely younger in male. They are organized into different subreddits. Um, basically there's like a different forum for different topics. Um, each one of these subreddits is, um, is managed by a volunteer moderator. Um, so these are people who are very enthusiastic about a topic and they set the rules for that subreddit. And if there is one thing to know about Reddit is that you need permission, not forgiveness. Um, I do not recommend just going in and dallying around and saying, oh, I posted, you know, 
I wrote a story about this topic, so I'm just going to go post it there. Um, I some subreddits are very, very um, wary of publishers or what they see as brands coming in. They really only want people. Um, so please check in with moderators before you jump in um, to a subreddit. The other thing to think about with Reddit, they do have something called an AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything, which is a Q&A format um, where someone can jump in and um, you know, someone will say, hi, I am a neuroscientist, ask me anything, and users will post questions on the Reddit, um, that Reddit thread, and then whoever it is, the neuroscientist can go through and answer them. Pinterest, on the other hand, overwhelmingly female, often used by lifestyle or fashion publications. What you're doing is you're saving a pin onto a board. Um, it is a way for people to either discover new content. If you, you know, are like, I want to make healthy meals for my family, you can search for healthy meals, or you can also save content yourself. Um, you, if you are going into Pinterest, you're also thinking about optimizing for search, which means people are going into there, they're searching for something specific, so you really are thinking about keywords for Pinterest. LinkedIn, business, work, career focused, um, a more educated um, user base, um, college educated and up. Um, content on here is probably going to be business work or career focused. And I also want to mention they do have a news curation team. I have not been able to tap into that, um, but maybe you'll have better luck. Um, they're also owned by Microsoft, if that is something that is of interest. TikTok is the newest one, um, a very young audience. It's short form vertical video, kind of a scary, accurate algorithm. <laughs> um, there was, I just started watching um, the Wall Street Journal had done an investigation into how they are, how they run their algorithm. It's very accurate um, to a slightly scary degree. Um, they are very fun videos. Um, I would recommend looking at the Washington Post TikTok if you are interested in seeing more of how a publisher is using TikTok. Um, I want to give a shout out also to messaging apps, um, primarily WhatsApp. Um, I do work in the United States, so I have not, where WhatsApp is not nearly as big. I have not personally done a lot of work on trying to do audience engagement through any of these messaging apps. I've got WhatsApp, Messenger, Signal, um, Telegram, WeChat, um, but it is one of the biggest sources of news for most, for people around the world. Um, and there are publishers that are trying different ways of using them in order to engage their audience. So I wanna make sure that one is on your radar. Um, a few honorable mentions, Snapchat, still the top app for teenagers slash Gen Z, um, even though I, I don't think publishers are using that space quite as much. Nextdoor, um, if you are doing local news, maybe that's one to get on your radar. Nextdoor is like a neighborhood app um, where it's all geolocated based on where you live. Tumblr, it's still around. It's a microblogging um, app. And it's just not nearly as popular as it used to be, but just be mindful, it's still there. Clubhouse is another new one. Clubhouse is audio only. It's a way that you can basically listen in on a conversation, um, maybe listening in on a live panel. Um, there's been some interesting stuff there. You can check it out. I've, I've listened in on a couple audience related panels. It's interesting. And then YouTube. Um, YouTube shows up a lot when you look at reports about where people are getting their news. So I want you to also be mindful that that is where a lot of people are going to get their news coverage. Um, but YouTube is a whole other ball game. Um, if you're thinking about like building a YouTube channel or optimizing for YouTube, it's a whole other thing. Great. That was my very quick overview. Um, if you have more questions on any of the individual ones, I would love it if you put it in the chat and, or in the Q&A. And if you're doing anything interesting on any of the platforms, I would love it if you could also put that in the chat. 
I do want to end with, I do want to give one quick PSA. Um, since I am talking to everyone about getting more active on social media, I also think it's worth mentioning that you should be thinking a little bit about online security or your digital security. This is um, a pretty comprehensive manual for about online harassment. Um, this is probably getting into some of the worst case scenarios. Even if you're not very active on social, I still would recommend doing a little bit of a digital security tune-up, making sure that you've got unique passwords, that you've got two-factor authentication, um, and just checking your name every once in a while. If your byline is out there, um, even if you're not very active, I think it's still worth trying to keep an eye on your own digital security. And this is a good website with some tips on how to do it. And then I also want to point to a couple of other additional resources. Um, the first, please read my chapter. The link's right there. Um, one newsletter I read every week is the Social Media Geek Out newsletter by Matt Navarra. Um, he goes through and collates all of the news from all of these different platforms, um, and it comes out every Friday. Um, and it's just kind of, it's an essential read for me. Um, if you're interested in learning and reading more about online culture, Taylor Lorenz, who is a reporter for the New York Times, um, covers the, like, the creator space and what sorts of things people are doing on platforms and creating content. Um, I will note, I think she just went on book leave um, today or something, so she might not actually be as active now. Uh, if you're wanting to read more about the industry news um, and maybe some more about what the platforms are actually doing, Platformer by Casey Newton um, goes into really deep dives um, on what's actually happening on more of a business level. And if you're interested in more the business side of using social media for your publication, um, I've been listening a lot to the Journalism Growth Club podcast and you can get that at that link there. So thank you so much. Um, and I will give it back to Josh. Baby, thanks so much. Really appreciate that. Great stuff. I know you could go into so much more depth than you do in your chapter. Um, it's hard to just sort of skim the surface. And I think one of the most interesting things there is that um, lifespan of a post. And I know at, uh, at our operation, we, we probably post a story to Twitter four or five, six times a day, but only maybe once a day on Facebook or LinkedIn because mm -hmm. the time span is so different. Um, we're going to hand it off to Jacita in, in just a second. I want to say I posted the online field harassment annual link in the chat. Um, of course, you have all these links in your chapter. Um, there was a great comment from, uh, I think it was Chris Parsons, um, who said he has about 40 groups in Facebook that he's a member of where he posts science articles and podcasts. And he says it's a great way to get his materials out. But there is one question that I wanted to hit right away, which is, um, uh, uh, Mohammed Yahya asks, the bulk of your social media activity comes from others. I think he means in terms of incoming traffic. Do you have tips on how to create social media content that people would want to share? Um, to clarify, is that question meaning like creating the story, like a story that people will want to share or creating no, our like own the, post? Like Yeah, I think the post that becomes a shareable post. So there are a few ways you can think about it. Um, I mean, if you want to get on the most marketing-y way of thinking about it, um, when someone is sharing your content, um, really what they're doing is they're sharing something that they think reflects well on them, if you want to think on the most cynical way of, do, of thinking about it. Um, so I'm going to start with the most cynical, um, is that you're trying to think this is you know, it's something that makes me look smart if I share this with my friends. It's something that um, I agree with. It's something that is showing my point of view. It's something that like I am not um, articulate enough in order to say myself and someone else has said it better for me. I know when I share stuff a lot of the time, that's when I see another reporter who says like, I'm like, oh gosh, I could never write a tweet this, you know, that encapsulates this as well as they did. So I'm going to share that um, myself. Um, I also think, I mean, what you're, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say specifically, like this is what will make it shareable. Um, I think I think what you're saying there yeah. is simply appealing to people's appealing, you know, to... appealing, appealing to people's sense of themselves and also you know anything that's really clever um, you know I think clever things 
tend to, to go a long way. Um, I know we'll get more into this, so um, I want to be cognizant of the time. And uh, Chasita, let's go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Everyone see that well? Looks great. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about pretty much finding sources or as the title says, from timeline time line to headline. So the things we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about modern media, media consumption, using your user generated content, and that kind of touches on the question that someone just asked about how to create a post that people are likely to share and user generated content is one of the, it's, it's, I think the content that by and large goes the farthest on social media, then we're going to talk about finding sources and uh, social media is very time consuming, but I want to, in the end, encourage everyone on why their voice matters on social media. So all of, all of the, uh, the facts and figures I'm going to give you come from the pewresearch.org. Um, that's where I get a lot of my numbers on who's consuming media on who's consuming news on social media and what those demographics look like. So more than eight in 10 Americans get their news from digital devices. So that's including uh, television, websites, um, streaming platforms now people are getting their news from. So that's all those digital devices. Roughly half of Americans prefer to get their news on, on a digital platform. And like I was saying before, news apps and websites are at the top still. Um, but for those under 50, uh, it's a little different and also people under 50 are more frequently using their digital devices for news. People still re read newspapers, but more and more people are turning to digital sites. And almost all Americans recognize that social media companies have at least some control over the mix of news that people see and that has its pluses and minuses and people have their feelings about what that means. Um, so obviously young people like social. So if you look at where people are getting their news, the age group of 18 to 29, almost half of them are getting their news from social media. And then uh, news and websites for all of these age groups are still like a prominent, news websites and apps are still a prominent uh, source for getting their news. So we're gonna talk about where, where are your news focus users? So by and large, the social media users that are most interested in the news are on Facebook. And that is partly because most of, Facebook has the biggest pool of users, like Facebook has the most users on their platform. So that's also why they have a big chunk of news focused users there. But Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, then it just goes down from there. And I think Twitch is pretty relatively new. And also there's a note that TikTok isn't shown because I think TikTok is, I don't even know how, if that's even a year or two old. TikTok is like very, very young. So the top news site traffic drivers, Facebook is still the number one driver of traffic to news websites. It's true for Kaiser Health News, Facebook on, in regards to all the social media platforms, Facebook drives the most traffic followed by Twitter. And again, like I said, Facebook has the largest pool of users. So I wanna start off by talking about one of my favorite uh, projects is agar art. So when I worked for the American Society for Microbiology, I was their marketing coordinator, which also meant that I did their social media. Um, and so we had a website called Microbe World where people could submit photos of things that were microbiology related. So it could be things like agar art, it could be, you know, a picture of a microbe or it could just be anything. So when I was populating our Facebook page and our Instagram, I noticed that people really liked the agar art. It would constantly perform well on all of our social media platforms. So it was around December that um, I shared this picture as our picture of the day. We would do a picture of the day on social media. So, so funny. I took a screenshot of the post I shared back in 2014. So this is like, it's funny looking back on like where I first started doing social media. So 
It was the picture of the day. I thought to myself, these do really well. This slide right here, it looks like a Christmas tree. It's bacteria, but it looks like a Christmas tree. I'm gonna share it a few days before Christmas. And it went completely viral. And so when I saw that, I said to myself, we should, I looked around on social, I searched agar art, I, I saw other people sharing agar art, but no one was doing it in a consistent way. No one had taken it and made it their own. No one was doing an art contest. And so I went to my manager and I said, this does really well on social. What if we did an annual art contest and we made it our thing? So we branded it. We, um, I worked with a, um, a microbiology fellow. We came up with the contest rules and all of that. And we did it that one year. It was a huge success. It was all over the news. And five years later, they do this contest every single year. They, they get thousands of submissions from all around the world. And they always constantly have news orgs wanting to interview the society to talk about the contest. So even most recently this year, they had a feature in the Smithsonian Magazine. And um, I just took this quote, because I think it's so cool, where they say that um, agar art isn't new, but the genre didn't get much attention until the last decade when ASM brought agar art into the spotlight with an annual contest. So that is just something that um, will forever be cool to me. And here are just some of my favorite um, agar art. It's just amazing to see that this is literally drawn with bacteria. So it takes like a lot of ingenuity from the microbiologist to know how um, bacteria express themselves in color, the rate in which they grow in order to paint on the Petri dish and then let it grow to produce the image. And then they take a photo of it because obviously you can't stop bacteria from growing. So they take a photo of it when it's at its height of what they want it to look like. And then they submit the photos to us. So these are some of my favorites. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is a story that I did that ended up in the New York Times style section about plastic surgery and Instagram. So hashtag Giles doll, what's that? So I was looking for a just like a sports massage therapist and I found this woman named Ty and I found I looked at her Instagram and I noticed all these hashtags with like a last name in the word doll. And I thought to myself, what is that? So this is where I say, be curious. I started clicking on all these hashtags and seeing all these accounts. And I wanted, I wanted to know what it was about. So I asked Ty to explain it to me. And as she explained it to me, I was just like, this would be a really cool story. Like, um, I've never heard of this. And she kind of walked me through the world of uh, post-op massage therapy and um, getting massages and how uh, these women who are getting massages form sort of these patient groups using Instagram where they make accounts, they're private accounts, but within the account, they document their surgery journey. They share tips with each other. Um, the hashtags correlate to the doctors that they're getting the surgery from. So if you wanna see the work of a certain doctor, you click on their hashtag and you can see all the girls who are their dolls, so to speak. So this was just like a completely different world to me that I learned about. Um, the next one is vaping. So I don't know if you all remember a year or two, two years ago when everyone was focused on children and vaping and wanting to pass all these laws to um, make it harder to get the vape juice and to get the vapes, to get them out of schools and to get them out of kids' hands. But then online, I noticed adults who vape being really vocal about not wanting this to happen. And so as I started searching online, I started seeing different kinds of like, the headline says cloud chasers, coil builders, vape modders. And I'm like, what is that about? And it's just, there are people who their whole thing is making cocktails of different kinds of vape juice. So right here, I have a recipe from one of the people I spoke to. It's her recipe for strawberry coconut milk, where she mixes different vape juices to make this flavor. And then this DIY or die is a guy I interviewed for the story. And his hat says, make America vape again. So these are people that felt had been vaping for years, have whole, it's a whole subculture. They, there are people that get really into uh, doing tricks with the, the vape smoke to, they get really into building the coils. Like there's just this whole underground community of it. So I learned about it 
and I wrote about it and it was really fascinating to me. So next I'm going to talk to you about some lessons learned from when you're when you're exploring and learning about um, communities on social media. So the do's and don'ts. Don't be Christopher. Don't be Christopher Columbus. Um, I didn't discover vaping or vape modders or cloud chasing or coil building. I didn't discover Instagram or surgery or Instagram dolls. I, I found it online. I saw it online and I wrote about it. I didn't discover it. I didn't make it up. I just wrote about it. And I wasn't even the first person to write about it. I just wrote about it differently. So I can tell you from my lessons learned with the, uh, the Instagram doll story, there were some bloggers that were really upset with me that um, felt like they had been covering this for so long and why do I get all the attention for it? And it just goes to show like, there's nothing new under the sun. The, the key is in the execution of something. And also bloggers, you know, they mostly focus on gossip. I focused on the patient groups and the ingenuity of using Instagram to create these patient groups. Um, and so I got a lot of trolly comments on my Instagram. Like Katie was saying, once your byline's out there, it's really easy for people to find you. So I ended up having to turn my comments off because I was just getting so many different comments. Um, and you just, you ignore it. And, and another issue that came up is some girls were upset that um, their, their Instagrams were being found. And another to what Katie was saying, even though there is no privacy online, the good thing to do is to ask people's permission. If you're gonna use a screenshot of their profile, even though it's public, it's just the right thing to do to ask people if they're okay with it. Um, so those are, those are my takeaways from those two, dealing with those two um, subgroups. The next story I'm gonna tell you about is the story I did on hip hop and opioids. And so it's, a, it's not a new issue. It's the same issue, but there's new research. There are, there are people that are now researching hip hop lyrics and the frequency with which opioid abuse and use appears in the lyrics. So there's these new researchers that I interviewed, but I couldn't find sources. I wanted to talk to some independent hip hop artists who had either had substance abuse issues themselves or new friends who had and wanted to talk about it. And I just was having such a hard time finding people. So enter Clubhouse. I'm on Clubhouse and I say here, always identify yourself. So in my Clubhouse bio, it says that I work as a journalist. It says that I work for KHN. and it says where my bylines are, just to completely be transparent so that when I enter a Clubhouse chat room, people know who I am and that, you know, I might be listening in for a story or I might be looking for sources. So that's, that's very important to do. Um, and what ended up happening is I joined um, some different hip hop chats uh, with people who care about hip hop and who care about the, the healthcare aspect of hip hop, who care about the artists. And I ended up finding um, this guy who has an independent magazine, his name is Kelby. He has this independent magazine called Making It Magazine. And when I was telling him about the story idea in this clubhouse chat room, he was like, I wanna help you with that. So he made a Google form and sent it out to his listserv from his magazine. And all of these artists responded to it and they said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about that or I'm willing to share my experience. And I was able to find the sources I needed to make this story. So that's all in networking on social media and finding sources, just being who you are and exploring the issues that you really care about, attending webinars, joining discussions, following researchers. Um, really just being a part of the communities that you want to talk about and that you want to write about. So what, en what ended up happening here after the story published is I did a quick spot with NBCLX, which is a new um, network from NBC that's focused on millennials. So I'm just going to play the, sec the clip from the segment. Uh, your reporting indica indicates actually that a lot of the attention here is focused on white suburban and rural communities. However, the risk is also there for people of color in urban communities too. Can you break all of that down for us as well? Sure. So with the statistic that you gave from the CDC, within that, a report from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, a 2020 report says that even though the opioid crisis focused more on white um, suburban and rural communities, it's still a huge problem in the black community. A 2020 Stage Journal research paper found a large 
increase in prescription opioid overdose deaths among black people. And the paper also found that the rate of death almost tripled between 1999 and 2017. And like you said, synthetic opioids like fentanyl are affecting opioid death rates among black people more severely than other populations. One of the rappers that I spoke to told me that on the streets, you have to be really careful about buying prescription opioids because they could be pressed fentanyl pills that have the same markings as the prescription pills. And I think the belief was that prescription pill abuse is something that you see in the suburbs, but you also see this in the urban communities, in the black community, and it's something that permeates through the population. Uh, your report. Okay, so so what, right? So why should we care about social media and sourcing and being on social media? Well, more and more people are getting their news and other important information from social media. More than half of US adults get their news from social media often or at least sometimes. And so to this, I say you need to be where the information exchanges are happening. Whether you like social media or not, it is here to stay. It's only growing. There's going to be new platforms and we need to be where the action is happening. But we've got issues, you know, like social media has issues. There's disinformation, things move fast. And a lot of times things that are, are outrageous move fast and get a lot of clicks and it could be full of the wrong kind of information. It's hard to vet who's actually a subject matter expert versus who's just pretending. There's trolls, there's bots, there's scammers. You get harassed online. There's violent content that you're constantly being subjective to. So it could be really hard on your mental health when you're constantly you know, being a social media editor, I'm on social media almost every single day for hours at a time. And um, knowing when to take a break and step back is something that you have to constantly remind yourself of. So, I wanted to talk about some of the, the OG, some of the old platforms. So I don't know if everyone remembers these, but I used to have a Black Planet page way, way back when. Black Planet is, Black Planet is like 22 years old. Um, and then like MySpace, and I don't know if people remember Dial-Up and AIM Messenger, but these weren't really news sites. These were like, I think Black Planet was a dating site or like a, like a hangout type of site. MySpace also just like people had their music on there. These weren't really news sites. Um, the social media we have today, it's important to remember that we're learning and defining this field of social media management and being social media editors in real time. Like Facebook is only 17 years old. Twitter just got its learner's permit, it's 15 years old. Instagram is only nine years old. These are very new platforms. I, I say this um, to myself sometimes that, you know, 20 years ago, this wasn't even a job. Like, so there was no social media editor. There was no social media manage, manager. And when I was in college, I would have never imagined that my job would full-time be working on social media, creating content. So um, to speak to some of the harms of social media and it being so new, I, I actually, my first byline was uh, uh, for Vice, for KHN for Vice. And it was about how um, jobs in social media, they require people to face the cruelest parts of the internet. You know, a lot of times when people complain about brands, they don't realize like, it's not the brand that you're yelling at or abusing. Like there's a social media manager behind that account. Um, and they oftentimes have little control over what's happening. Um, last year, speaking of the violence on social media, last year, during the height of all of the protests and what happened with George Floyd, I, I penned an op-ed just talking about the difficulty of being a black social media manager during this time and kind of constantly being bombarded with violent images. Um, I think we're seeing that kind of happen again with what's happening in Afghanistan where you almost, it's hard to filter out these images and these videos and constantly seeing it, it can get really disturbing. And I think, like I said, when you look at how young these platforms are, I don't think anyone knew or understood how big they would grow, how far they would go. And we're still learning how to make social media a safe space and a space where there is better, more accurate information. And this is why your voice matters. We need more subject matter experts online. So, the largest social media platforms control the content of their feeds using algorithms and they rank posts and things like that. 
We need more people who know what they're talking about in those spaces. We also need more social media experts teaching media literacy. And we need more researchers, data analysts, journalists, drop, learning how to drop the, the jargon and how to communicate with the public. So that's kind of why taking courses like this and just like learning more about how to use social media, it's important because the, the people that have the disinformation, they're out there and they're loud. And we need the people who have the, the factual information, who do the research, who have the data, who have study these topics to also be out there and be just as loud, if not louder than the people that don't really know what they're talking about. And uh, that's it for me. So follow me at CG on social on Twitter. And that's all I've got. <laughs> Jazeera, thank you very much. And, and there are some questions here, but what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, put a pin on the questions real quick and just go to Suki. Um, just for time, and Suki, I'll let you go, and then we'll 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 get to as many questions after you're done as possible. Then I know we'll go to everybody. So, Suki, I'm going to hand it off to you. All right, you, hi Chelsea everyone. Uh, we heard some great things so far, so I'm just going to try to kind of go into a case study and expand upon uh, what's been already said. But thank you again just for being here. It's wonderful to see such a large international presence today. We're all really honored. So with that, let me share my screen. Does that look okay? I'm actually gonna go into present mode. <laughs> so let's do that. Yep, looks great. Awesome. All right, so here's some more best practices for social article and video uh, packaging specifically. Oh, there we go. So not to be like a huge ad, <laughs> but just to give some context of what we do um, at Nova PBS. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are the science documentary series. And we've been around since the mid seventies, which means that we haven't been on digital uh, for nearly as long, but it's become a really important part of our strategy, um, especially when we're talking about international folks because our long form broadcasts aren't accessible to everyone outside of the US. And so that we're able to reach people in other places or people that might not be you know, tuning in every Wednesday night to watch a documentary film. Well, how are we reaching different audiences on digital and also kind of rebranding ourselves so that we're able to be situated that we can break science news when that's warranted, um, you know, produce informative short form videos, whether they're extensions of um, our broadcast through you know, excerpting different parts of films or actually creating original video content. Um, again, we also publish a whole bunch of articles every year and all of this content really lands on social as well as our uh, bi-weekly email newsletters that we put out. So I know Katie touched upon this in the very beginning that social is just kind of the singular piece of where people are finding uh, your stories. So search is obviously really big. Um, we're talking about Google primarily or other search engine platforms that people are using to just search keywords for stories that might be relevant to them. Um, a big example that we had recently was we did a story on uh, if you've been exposed to the coronavirus, when should you get tested? And so that's something that's incredibly searchable. It's going to cause a whole bunch of people to actually land on our article and, and hopefully read it. Um, referral as well, internet and direct search, emails, newsletters, all of that also plays. But social is a decent chunk, as you can see from these arrows. And so I think this is really important, you know, for every individual and every brand, you know, this is definitely something that we think about on a daily basis, but it's really important for everyone uh, to define their audience, you know, who do you really want to reach? It's one thing to kind of grow so that you have a whole bunch of followers, but it's a different thing to really grow intentionally so that you're reaching people who actually care about your content, who actually care about STEM and learning and engaging with it. Um, and understanding that just as what's been said before that different platforms, different spaces like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, wherever you are, are going to have different algorithms and therefore they're going to have, you know, different ways in which people are uh, getting that content, um, engaging with that content, and ultimately they serve different needs and also serve different audiences. So 
furthermore, where are you posting? Um, this is again, very Nova specific. So Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are three of our largest platforms that we use. Um, they're really great spaces for articles and video. Um, if we're talking about science news stories that are being covered in video, it's important to keep aspect ratio in mind. So I know YouTube was mentioned before. Um, you can assume that most people who are engaging with your content on YouTube are actually looking on their computer or on their TV. So that means that you can cut things 16 by nine. So it's taking up a whole big screen. Uh, whereas on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, people are generally using mobile. So that means that you're going to have a different dimension. You have more vertical space to cover and that's where four by five or square video uh, comes into place. And we think really carefully about all of our thumbnails. So those little images that come up if you're scrolling through YouTube, for example, um, what does that look like? Does it grab your attention? If you squint your eyes, are you still engaged uh, with that thumbnail? So that's something fantastic to implement is the squint test, we call it. Um, and titling and description, this is really important for all of our content, be it video, podcast, article, all that stuff. Um, Posting strategy is really important. Again, whether you're an individual or a brand that you're working for, uh, think about the day and the, of the day of the week and the time um, that you're posting. So you can actually follow trends through looking at your analytics and see which days of the week are best for you as well as what times are optimal. Um, so we found that you know Tuesdays work really well for us. Friday evenings surprisingly work really well for posting video. So just think about things like that. And then also cross-posting, sharing, uh, what other brands, what other individuals do you wanna be amplifying and kind of build that into your strategy as well as reposting. So if you have a, a story that you reported and suddenly a news hook has merged that makes your story relevant again, if it's evergreen, absolutely okay to go and, and repost it. You could be doing your audience a big service. Um, paid ads, a whole other animal, not really going to get into that. This is more brand specific, but Generally, brands are going to have a certain bucket of money budgeted out to actually run different paid ads. Um, and we generally like to amplify the content that is performing really well and is really important to us. So it's really important to be inviting. Um, you kind of have to look at the individual pieces of content that you have and see the nature of it and what kind of can warrant some humor, um, what's more serious. You can adjust your tone in your post based on you know, this content that you're posting. Obviously you don't want to use a GIF of a penguin, a penguin pooping when you're talking about a really serious issue. Um, this is pulled from one of our YouTube series called Antarctic Extremes. Uh, but if your content is funny, humorous, has to do with you know, World Animal Day of some sort, you know, something like this is fair game. So really changing your tone based on the content that you're trying to amplify. Um, and then we think it's really important, obviously, just like in your traditional science journalism, um, remove or be really careful about defining jargon. So I think early on in the pandemic, we saw a whole bunch of brands and a whole bunch of journalists do this really well with SARS-CoV-2, with actually saying, you know, this is the virus that causes COVID-19 infection versus just putting that word out there and letting people kind of think about it on their own and, and come to their own conclusions. Um, that goes beyond you know, just being a good journalist. I think it also helps with combating misinformation, you know, accidentally spread, spreading false knowledge just because you haven't defined something carefully enough. Um, and the question here, is it a specific species more searchable, likely to resonate with your audience or is a group of animal that belongs to more likely? So just using animals as an example, because I love them. Um, generally, when people are looking up different pieces of news and it has to do with certain content, they're not going to be super specific. So I think species versus a group of animal is just one example uh, to kind of cover this larger topic. And this is a slide that I literally just added in <laughs> because of some of the questions that we were getting in chat. So this is just a helpful diagram uh, that comes from WGBH, which is the PBS partner station I work for. Um, that really gives you a rundown of what kind of tone uh, you can talk in on these different platforms. So LinkedIn, obviously it's gauged toward professionals, um, but it's also really important to implement some of your own kind of personality there so that you don't come off super robotic. So be human. 
Uh, Facebook, it's really important to be open and build context. So you can go a little bit longer um, in the amount of words that you might be using in your social copy than say on Twitter, where it's really important to be you know, short to the point, timely, um, doing a bunch of retweeting and amplifying of other people's voices. Um, it's a good space to build context, especially because we've seen Facebook is such a platform where a lot of misinformation and disinformation tends to proliferate. Uh, the difference between those two, by the way, so misinformation is false information that's spread without malicious intent. So it just kind of, it can come from disinformation that is spread intentionally to actually cause people to believe in, in false information. But misinfo kind of stems generally from disinfo. And then we have Instagram, um, again, owned by Facebook now but it's a space to be really relatable. You see a lot of influencers in that space. Um, you can also inspire people there as well. And here's just an example um, of some social copy that we put out with this story. So again, if you look at the headline here, we have silver backed Chevrotain in the name. So that's something that's probably not super searchable, um, but a way to really bolster that is by explaining what it is in the social copy. So it's this elusive cat-sized deer relative that um, researchers just noticed uh, after a long time of assuming that it was extinct out in the wild. Um, this is just an example of what our videos on social again look like. So on the left, we have an example from Facebook. Uh, we're using that four by five aspect ratio. So it's mostly vertical. Um, we actually burn on captions so that we don't have to upload a caption file, which is generally a lot smaller and less engaging. Um, but on YouTube to the right, we use a caption file. Um, again, that's really important for accessibility. So if people are listening either without sound um, or hard of hearing, then they're able to engage with our content still. And again, we're taking up more space here by making it 16 by nine. Um, moving on to more video stuff, packaging really matters. So I'm using a GIF to the left to really show uh, what an engaging first three seconds of a video might look like. Ignore the looking for life on Mars text here. But um, this was taken from footage of the Mars Perseverance rover actually landing on the red planet. And it was super cool. It was the first time that NASA ever got footage that looked like this. And so why not you know, work with NASA to get this and put it into a video? And if we use this in the first three seconds, which we did, uh, it just engages really nicely with our audience. They're like, that's super cool. So that's really important to actually get people to watch your content if we're talking about video. Uh, to the right, you can see kind of our packaging for YouTube. So the thumbnail actually has some informative text on it, surviving the next big one. This is talking about a potential earthquake that can happen around the Cascadian fault line um, in the Pacific Northwest in the US. And you can see that that text on the image is actually different than the words of the title. So the title is the Pacific Northwest is due for a major earthquake, but the image says surviving the next big one. And that's just part of YouTube best practices is to try to diversify the language that you're using. Um, again, making your thumbnail really grabby so that your audience is interested in engaging with your content. And then just a case study. So this is actually a story that I reported and published a couple of months ago. Um, here in the US, obviously we've been having a lot of issues with getting coronavirus vaccines uh, to people, um, dealing with a lot of vaccine hesitancy and the Native American community is actually a really unique story in which they have the highest rate of COVID vaccine, uh, vaccination in the country right now. So my colleague, uh, Alyssa Greenberg, she's one of our reporters, she actually found that piece of information on Twitter. So on our left, uh, this isn't the exact tweet that she found. I, I couldn't find it <laughs> through a bunch of sleuthing, but this is a very similar one. So she found something that looked like this. And then in Slack, our, our work messenger, she contacted myself and our other editor and was like, this looks like an awesome story. I don't have time to do it. Would one of you want to cover this? Um, so we said, absolutely, this is awesome. We did some fact checking. So to the right is uh, once we clicked on that CDC link, this is the kind of infographic and information that we were getting. Sure enough, you can see that American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest rate here. So it was a go. 
And then this is what our stories look like before we actually publish them on our site. Um, we put them in a Google Doc. That's where all the editing happens. And that's also where all this good brainstorming around our headline, which we abbreviate to head, um, our subhead or our deck happens, the slug or the URL of the story. Uh, when we're packaging the slugs, we try to avoid using any sort of filler words like the and blah, blah, blah. Like stay, stay with keywords and try to front load that. So that means that the most important keywords to your story appear in the beginning of your slug, not at the end. Uh, and then we have our social copy as well. Um, typical, typically it's myself or our other digital editor who's writing all the social copy, uh, but generally with articles, we like to brainstorm that together as an editorial and social media team. So we have a couple of options here that we worked with. Um, generally we have our social be different than what that deck or subhead reads, but it's also really important to play around. So we noticed that a couple of other media organizations and individuals who are sharing our story were just posting it with a subhead and that happened to be performing really well. So we're like, why not try that? So here's the strategy that we take with pretty much everything, but just really focusing on this story. Um, we first developed a plan to post on Facebook and Twitter, and then we had a paid media plan. We had some money to put behind the story so that we were reaching these specific audiences, you know, people between the ages of 18 and 65 plus in the United States where the story is taking place. And then with these interests, so human rights, Native American civil rights, epidemiology, social equality, Baltimore, where the story takes place in part, uh, Native American culture, centers for disease the CDC whoops <laughs> oh no there you go and um, some other interest here and then what we like to do too is on our smaller platforms Instagram Reddit LinkedIn also see the activity that's happening around um, our stories in these places and try to amplify uh, what's going on organically with other brands or individuals kind of amplifying our stories and also developing ways in which we can you know, promote our own content um, via Instagram stories and other strategies. We also like to reach out to our partner group. So we have ongoing emails with other science news publications, including Noble Magazine. So we try to reach out to each other and we say, hey, we have this new content if you're interested in sharing it on your social platforms. And then we also monitor apps like CrowdTangle. That's a fantastic app. It's owned by Facebook. It enables us to see uh, what our competitors or other <laughs> fellow science media organizations are putting out on their social uh, platforms, mostly Facebook. And we can see what's overperforming and what's underperforming uh, for them. So that's a great way to actually get science news story ideas if you're thinking about writing an aggregate or thinking about extending your reporting upon something that's already been reported on. Um, and then also big part of our strategy since we don't generate a ton of content on a weekly basis is actually fill in those gaps on social media by trying to amplify other science stories from other brands. Um, so we use CrowdTangle a lot to get um, stories to do that. So here's our Facebook results looking at those three different posts with the three different kinds of language. Um, the one on the left is the first one and that did have a thousand dollars spend <laughs> behind it. So that's why it's reaching almost 530,000 people whereas the other ones reached about 65, 60,000 uh, people or so. But you can really see how there's different opportunities. The first one is very specific to the time that the story was published with the exact metrics here, 45.5% and 39.1%. Um, whereas we get kind of more general in time or op find opportunities where we can directly quote one of our sources if we think that they said something that was particularly stand out and might resound really well with our audience. And then here we have Twitter, Reddit, and LinkedIn. So on the upper right hand corner, um, this is a kind of digest that we get from CrowdTangle on a regular uh, weekly basis that goes into my email inbox. And I can actually see what Reddit users um, or when they're posting Nova content, if they use the word Nova in their post, then we automatically get this in this email. So I was able to see that, oh, hey, this story um, that this individual shared here and that this individual shared below got 12 and 13,000 upvotes. So it was trending on Reddit. So we were able to jump in 
and actually comment you know, from myself, from the reporter of that story and answer any questions or provide any insight um, to social media users on Reddit. And that we can jump to the Q and A now. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Suki. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, I, I know uh, there's so much to say about social, so we've, we're a little bit over not over time yet, but we're running up against our our two thirty time. So we're going to extend this just a little bit to try and get to more questions, and hopefully, folks can stick with us uh, for a little while. Um, so let me jump into questions. We have a lot of them. I'll try and get to as many as we can and, and sort of do a little bit of a lightning round um, uh, quick answers. So one that came from Sri Roy was, how do you know if social traffic is coming from your own posts or from others like you know those who are sharing your work? Um, who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Katie. So um, sorry, I got a little enthused there. Um, <laughs> depending on what... Um, analytics tool you have on your website, um, we use Google Analytics. So when you use Google Analytics and you go into a report, you can generally see where your traffic is coming from. And there are some usual, like if you um, go into the acquisition report, it'll have your source in Medium. And there are a lot of automatically tagged sources that you'll see in there. Like you'll see Facebook slash referral. Um, what you want to do when you're posting your own things is coming up with a tracking or a UTM strategy. So um, apologies to everyone who is not wanting to, this is gonna be, get, get a little nerdy. Um, if you ever look at a URL and you see at the end of the URL, there's a question mark and then a lot of text at the end of that question mark, that's going to be the tracking information that's getting added to your URL and sending it back to um, whatever your analytics software is. So for me, like every time we post on one of our own channels, I have a set set of um, like a set structure. So every time I post on Facebook, I always make sure it says the source is Facebook and the medium is a post. Or if it's an old story, I'll say a rerun. Um, you can get really, really nerdy about that and go through a lot. Um, but I would really encourage you to look into what your analytics software is and being very thoughtful about coming up with a tracking structure. And, and a lot of, I think you all probably use tools like CrowdTangle or Sprout Social or Hootsuite that has some automatic UTM parameters that can be appended to your posts, right? Yeah, if you're like on Buffer, I think you can, we use Buffer and you can set it up to automatically append. I kind of like to have more control over what gets added at the end. Um, so I actually just manually add them. And um, I'll drop in the chat, there's a URL builder that is really, really helpful. Um, or you can just set up a spreadsheet and say, every time I'm going onto Facebook, I'm gonna use this and this and this. Um, that's how you do it. And if you don't recognize where it's coming from, that's probably coming from someone else. <laughs> Terrific, Katie, thank you. Um, Jacita, there are a couple of questions here that came out of, of what you spoke about. Um, one from Barbara Pinho is, what kind of tips do you have for maintaining your mental health while being a social media manager? You spoke a bit about some of the challenges you've faced and what you get immersed into. So do you have tips for how to stay, uh, stay sane? Yeah, sure. So um, since, since last year, especially, Twitter has made some improvements on its site. Like, and then also in your settings, you can do something where you can stop the autoplay of videos. The thing that's hard about that is, um, I think Katie mentioned this, people take screenshots or they'll take a video and they'll alter it. And so these are all using kind of automated uh, scraping tools. So when someone takes a video and they alter it, um, it becomes a new video. So they might have censored it before, but since someone maybe cut it or added something else to it, now it's a new video. And so you'll still get exposed to that. So one, I adjust my settings so that things don't autoplay. The other thing I do just on my end, being someone who puts content out there, we just recently did a story on suicide and uh, communities of color. We put content warnings before the slideshow on Instagram. So people know like this, this the next couple of slides are gonna talk about suicide. The other thing that I do, just taking time off. Um, social media is attached to my cell phone. I turn my notifications off after a certain time, um, taking just, taking vacation time, my managers are really good about understanding like when I'm off, I'm off. Like next week I'm off, I'm not doing any social media, computer news related stuff. And then also just taking a break to like get up, go for a walk outside or read a news story about something fun that you like. So kind of balancing what you're consuming throughout the day. 
Um, especially being in healthcare news, a lot of times the stories are, are kind of can skew a little negative. So then sometimes I might read something that's completely not related to healthcare or look at cats, you know, like <laughs> something like that. Terrific. Um, there was a question here, um, and I think uh, I think I know the answer, uh, and I'm sure it's something you can answer with the. Um, well, the question from Lisa Winter is, how big are the social media teams at your publications? Um, do any of you have a team bigger than one? <laughs> I, well, so we are hired. We I had an assistant editor. She was an intern. She got hired full time as an assistant. She she since left to do you know for another opportunity, but I am hiring a new one. So there, I do have two candidates that I'm deciding between. So I will. It will be a team of two, and then. I'm hoping to also get like a video person, but to, the short answer is it, it was one. I was the first social media manager for KHN and I've been, I was one for like two years. So, you know, it, like I said, it's a new, it's a new field and people are still learning like what it takes to do the job and the fact that like, it's really not a one person job. And is it, is it fair to say that part of the job also is not taking all that on yourself, but teaching others in your organization how to be better at what they're doing? Yeah. And I, I can, I can say we actually have more like two half people. So it's like half me and then half our digital producer. Um, and something that was really helpful was we had actually reconfigured the digital producer job specifically saying, like they are going to help with social media. Um, and that has been a huge help. So I do want to give a shout out to helping, you know, a to our digital producer, Ashley, and then B to, um, bringing in more people because you are trying, it's really helpful if you're trying to bounce ideas off of someone else and not feeling like you're the only person working on it. Um, and we also do use our fact checkers also for helping us, um, especially with writing tweets and social copy because they're the last people who handle the content in some way. And if you're trying to pull interesting factoids out of a story, they're the ones who are gonna know if the factoids are true or not. Um, so that's a, I just want to throw that out there as a resource we use. And, and that prompts me to also give a, um, a plug to our sister project, ksjfactcheck.org. Um, it has a bunch of information on fact checking, uh, not just for social, but for, for all journalism. Um, Suki, there's a question from Diana that I think is um, particularly relevant for you. She asked uh, Diana Sasko, how uh, um, can you talk about making highly scientific information accessible to the lay person? Um, and Nova, of course, you know, delves deep into sort of, you know, highly complex topics, and you have to find a way to present that socially in, in a very um, clear, interesting way, but still maintain that accuracy. So are there a couple of things that you guys lean on to be able to, to find that balance? It's a great question. Um, I have to give a big shout out. I know that we're a little bit of a rival to the MIT program, and then here we are at KSJ right now, but um, a lot of the tools that I personally use, I learned through the UC Santa Cruz science communication program. Um, and so I think really it comes down to having a very journalistic foundation of, you know, thinking about your job as a science journalist or a science communicator is to ultimately take these really difficult concepts and I don't want to say water them down because it, it, you're also walking this fine line of you can't assume you know, less of your audience. You, you can generally assume that people have some sort of base knowledge. Um, so creating a respect there that that exists, but also making things as accessible as possible. And so I think it comes down to really writing things in an accurate but simplistic way. Um, so how do you say things in the fewest words as possible while still getting your accurate, factually correct point across? So that goes back to using terms that people are familiar with and um, being really careful about defining jargon. If you absolutely cannot avoid, you know, using a specific science word, um, how can you best define it to make it really accessible? And I think right now we're at this point where I want to give a shout out to our misinformation fellow that we have, Ray Maktoufi. She's been really fantastic with enlightening us that we're in this era that it's hard to be a straight up journalist. There's always going to be a little bit of advocacy as well. And I think science is in this moment where, you know, not everyone's a fan of it. Um, not everyone is trusting of scientists, of 
people in healthcare, um, people throughout the STEM community. And so how do we really amplify and, and bolster the work that those people are doing? How do we make them seem really human and relatable? So that's really important as well, um, even if it does dip a little bit into advocacy. Um, yeah, a lot of what we're talking about has been sort of ways to either mine social media or share content on social media. But there's also this third, I mean, these things all kind of interrelate, but there's this third category of really having engaging, if you want to call it dialogue with people on social media. And I'm wondering what, uh, and there's a question here about this um, from uh, uh, Nicole Jow. Are there things that you have done to see that engagement? Obviously, just you know, you have the Agar Art Contest as, as one example of this, um, which is brilliant. Those are just amazing uh, photos. But um, what other avenues for engaging have you found, or you know, a, a, a tip or someone that that can make that more effective? Anybody? You know, I would say for each platform, it's a little bit different, so it's kind of hard to give a, a blanket answer. And they also change. Like Instagram used to be photos, right? But now reels are dominating Instagram timelines. And also I think now um, the favor is kind of against things that look like straight up marketing pieces and more for things that look a little bit more authentically made by yourself. Or so, so that's why I point to user generated content. So even if you are generating the content yourself and making a video like just recording yourself talking about something, including some music behind it, you almost have to become a little bit of, of a producer these days with social media. It's like, uh, it's a lot, but you know, like I, I, I have a TikTok, I don't post that often on it. I'm still learning, you know, how to, how to do the TikTok that makes it, makes it go viral or makes it just get a lot of views. But a lot of times people, I think I wrote some things down, like people like they love sharing audio and video. They like things that resonate with them. So sometimes, even if it's just like, you know, those inspirational quote type things or things like you said that make people laugh. Um, so you, you have to first figure out what your audience is, what you're trying to get across to them and then create your content around that. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in some more. I'll jump in a little bit. That was fantastic, <laughs> by the way. Um, I'll say if you are, Kind of posting on behalf of a brand. Um, it is a little bit difficult at times to really put your own voice in there while still being professional, while still being consistent with that brand voice. But a space that you could be a little bit more creative is in the comments. And so if we receive specific comments, then that brings up a great opportunity for you know a reporter of the story to actually jump in there as a person, even if it's from Nova Sandal, and say, hey, like here's more insight here. And then just put their name and their title at the end of that comment. Um, it's something that we do a lot on Instagram and keep in mind too, kind of what are your bread and butter platforms? Where do you have a huge following and where do you have a growing following? And maybe the spaces where you have a growing following like for us, it's Instagram. Um, we can be a little bit more personal. You know, I'll post, I, I like doing photography. So I'll post my own pictures that I take of, of wildlife and different scenic things um, on Instagram and, and kind of just give myself credit or I'll take videos, you know, from our video producers or other photos from other teammates and just give them the credit at the end. And, and I think it's great too. Um, there's a study that came out of KQED, which is one of uh, the PBS channels that's out in San Francisco. Uh, they actually did this big research project a couple of years ago where they found that millennial audiences connect better with people than they do with brands. So they're really looking to read a piece from a specific author, like say Marina Corin, then actually going and being like, I love the Atlantic. They're saying, I love, you know, this very specific space reporter at the Atlantic. So just using that as an example that it's okay to be personal sometimes. Well, that's, you know, that's really smart on a couple of fronts. And one of them is that it emphasizes the point that what's so important isn't just becoming the social media manager for your, your brand's Twitter handle, but really empowering the staff to be better social media, you know, engagement people. I mean, not only do you have a um, multiplier effect, you have more of those people in the organization, but as you just said, people tend to follow those names rather than just the nameless, faceless brand. 
Um, I want to wrap up with just a couple of quick things. Uh, one, there was a question, I can't quite find it now, about, um, I think one of you mentioned uh, using GIFs and emojis, and somebody said, how do you do that and still stay professional? I'm going to jump in, and, and I'm sure you all have examples, but we uh, at the Chronicle just published uh, an, our annual almanac of higher education statistics, and when we posted it, I said, the almanac is here, the almanac is here. And I posted a, a, a clip of Steve Martin from The Jerk when the phone book is here. And to me, that was personable, still professional, and, and a lot of fun. And you know, it made me laugh anyway. And some people seem to like it. Um, but then I'm old. So, uh, but I think it is doable. And I think the um, uh, place where you can get them, the person, that, the person asked where you can get gifts, uh, is Giphy. Uh, I'm not sure if you have other sources that you use, but that's a pretty, pretty robust and well-known one. Um, you can make your own too. <laughs> you can make your own. That's, if if you you're feeling do? ambitious, I, do you I have use a URL that you use for that. Oh, so I mean specifically in in a video editing software, um, and then going onto Giphy and transforming that from an MP4 file into a GIF file, and then it can live on Giphy, or you can download it and just have it on your desktop. So Great. sometimes it's fun to make them too. Get into and that. I. I I think with on Giphy, you can also, if you're hosting it on YouTube, you might even be able to just plug the YouTube link in there and pull a couple of seconds out. If you're not as um, video editing savvy, there are ways that you can just plop it in there and, and generate it online. Oh, that's true. There's a lot of apps that if you just upload videos or pictures, they'll kind of figure it out for you. So I would search for different kinds of apps. And I did in the chat put in there, there was a recent story about Be More Public Health because they got noticed for how they were able to amplify their public health messaging using memes. And if you go on their Twitter, you'll see like, it's like full of memes and they're all funny. So I think it's like kind of breaking with tradition, especially at like science orgs, which are rooted in tradition that like bringing them to the, the modern times that like people talk with memes and gifts now. So like, you know, just getting on board with that. And the final thing about user generated content, because I saw someone ask about starting a photo contest. What I recommend is just like people like talking about themselves and they like sharing things. So sometimes I start off even just asking a question and asking people to respond to it or doing a poll on Twitter and like poll the people who follow you and see what they want to talk about or what they're interested in is a good place to start if you're wanting to do some kind of contest. Terrific. And I, I think it probably goes without saying that you also have to be immersed in these platforms yourselves. I mean, you can't just sort of do this and walk away. You have to be users of them. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Which is why I say it's time consuming, but your voice matters. And like, like I said, I'm on social media a lot. I think all of us are probably spend an unhealthy amount of time on social media, but it's, it's kind of like the matrix, right? When you, if you look at something long enough, you start to see patterns and you start to see, you start to see things and you start to look at things differently when you're, when you spend a certain amount of time on there. To me, it's like language immersion. If you want to really learn the language, you need to be immersed in it. Well, listen, thank you very much. I know we still have other questions here and I'm going to be a little bit presumptuous and say, if people want to reach out to you on Twitter, um, that's something that they're that you're willing to to do and, and answer some of these other questions we haven't gotten to. Um, so I hope that's okay. Thank you, everybody from around the world uh, who has uh, taken part in this. Uh, we love having you. I love seeing where everybody's from. Um, our sixth and final webinar will be on September 23rd. Um, you can go to ksjhandbook.org to register for that. Look for an email in the next several days with certificate of attendance for today, as well as um, a survey. And of course, you can also reach me uh, at the email from your registration link if you have any other questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Suki, uh, Teresa, and um, Katie. We love having you, love hearing from you. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Have a great day. Uh, take care. Bye bye. Thanks so much.